that was easy. Hi, so I want to talk about the Hamiltonian path problem and showing that it's NP-complete. This problem is of great interest in computer science and about trying to understand the structure of graphs. This result will tell you that in terms of Hamiltonian paths, there's very likely not going to be a very easy to understand formulation of what a Hamiltonian path is in a graph and how to actually determine whether there is one. So I have two graphs right here and Hamiltonian path is asking, is there a path going through all of the vertices, starting at one vertex, going through all the other ones, and not repeating any of them. So in this blue graph, you can show that there is no such Hamiltonian path. And the way you can show that is, let's say we start at that vertex, then if I try to go over to this vertex, then I'm gonna leave these three out over here. And if I try to go the other way, then I'm gonna leave that vertex out unless I try to come back, but I'm gonna repeat a vertex in that case. If you wanna talk about repeating vertices, those are called walks, but here we're talking about paths. So here, in this graph, there is a Hamiltonian path that visits every vertex exactly once. So if you start at, let's say, that one, then you go to that vertex, there, 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 and I visited every single vertex in this graph. So effectively, this one edge up here was the deciding factor in some sense about whether there's a Hamiltonian path or not. Here we're going to be talking about the directed Hamiltonian path problem. And what does that mean? That means I got to assign a direction onto each of these edges. So let's say I assign this direction on all of the edges. And if I do something similar down here, well, the one on the left is not going to magically get a Hamiltonian path if I assign a direction to each edge. But the one over here, it could, depending on how I oriented the edges. So if I assign a direction here, it's not going to change anything. So there's no Hamiltonian path on the blue one. There still is one on the yellow one because I, I put the direction of the edges in this way. So if we want to show that this is NP-complete, every NP-complete proof has to show that this thing is in NP and is NP hard. This language of all graphs that have a Hamiltonian path is in NP because you can be given as a certificate the permutation of the vertices. So let's say like, for example, down here, I have, let's say, vertex one there, two, three, four, five, six. If I'm given the permutation one, two, three, four, five, six, all I need to do is just verify, is one to two an edge, is two to three an edge, is three to four edge, four to five an edge, and five to six an edge. If every one of those is an edge, therefore I can, can, I can easily prove that this path that's given to me as a certificate is a Hamiltonian path or not. And so therefore Hamiltonian path is in NP because the size of that certificate is the number of vertices, and so it's polynomial in the size of the graph. So what I want to convince you now is that Hamiltonian path is NP hard. And in order to do that, we need to be able to reduce from a known NP complete problem. The typical one that is used for pretty much every NP complete proof is 3SAT, and we're going to use that here. So I want to show you that we can reduce 3SAT in polynomial time to Hamiltonian path. And that seems kind of hard. The instances of 3SAT are composed of formulas and variables, whereas the hand path problem is about graphs and edges and all that kind of other stuff. It's not really related. So what we want to do is to embed the 3SAT problem as a Hamiltonian path problem. You can think of reductions as just a translation of one problem to another, and that's no exception here. Okay, so let's think about what a 3SAT formula looks like. So it's like A1 or B1 or C1 and some other clauses here. So each one of these is a clause and there are gonna be an and of clauses and we don't know necessarily how many beforehand, but what we wanna do is we want to reduce in polynomial time in the size of this formula, the a graph that has a Hamiltonian path if and only if this formula is satisfiable. So let's call this formula phi. So then we want phi to be satisfiable if and only if the graph that we make, let's call it G, has a Hamiltonian path. How in the world are we going to actually do that? So the construction here is actually kind of slick in that 
it embeds the variables in a very nice way and connects them with the clauses. So here's what we're going to do. So let's say that the variables in the formula, the variables in the phi formula are, let's call them x1 up to xn. So those are the names of the variables. They can be negated or not, but it doesn't actually matter. We're going to handle that whether they're negated in the formula or not later. We're just considering the variables just by themselves. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make something called a variable gadget. A variable gadget is um, a little piece of the graph that involves this variable in some way. So it's important to note that since we're dealing with Boolean variables, they're either true or false, then something that we're going to make in this graph has to correspond to true and correspond to false. So because this graph is directed, because we're dealing with the directed Hamiltonian path problem, we're going to denote one direction that this, that this gadget can take to be the true direction and one direction to be the, the false direction. So here's how this is going to work. So let's say that we're dealing with variable xi. So I'm dealing with xi and we're gonna do this for every single variable. So I'm gonna have a little node up here that is called xi. And what are we going to do with it? What we're gonna do is we're going to have two directions that we can go. And so the left direction, let's just say, is the true direction. And the right one is the false direction. Although we can flip flop these as totally symmetric, but how we're going to connect it up to the clauses, that is going to be what we're going to do differently, depending on whether it's true or false. But you can have false being left. Okay, so how is this true going to work? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have a bunch of vertices in the middle that go back and forth between each other. So in a straight line where each one points to the right and to the left, apart from the ends, which only point inward, so to speak. So then we're going to keep doing this until I get to the ends, and let me extend this, this edge a little bit to there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rejoin them going downwards this way. So this variable gadget is composed of a single XI node up here, followed by a whole bunch of nodes in the middle that point going left and right here, and then the ends are the only ones that point down here. So let's think about what can happen. Well, the things that can happen are, before we do anything else, we could either go left and then just go straight down here, or we can go right and go straight down, or what we can do is go left and then go all the way right and then go down, or we can go right then all the way left and then down. Why can't I go like, let's say down right, then left, then right, then over, because we're dealing with Hamiltonian paths, which don't repeat vertices. So the possible Hamiltonian paths then, we can't just go left and then down because I will be missing all of these other vertices. And the same thing is true if I went right and then down. So the only possible Hamiltonian paths in this little bit are going left all the way across and then down, or going right and then all the way across and then down. So note that there are two possible Hamiltonian paths in this little gadget right here. Note that each one of them will correspond to the variable being true or false. Isn't that pretty cool? And so how are we going to connect all these up together is by stringing them together. So the variables are going to have, let's say x1 is first. And so here I'm going to have, I'm going to draw it like this. It's going to have a little uh, variable gadget corresponding to it. Then we're going to have the one for x2. So note that all of these have directions. I'm just being lazy and not drawing the directions in. So x2 is there. And we're going to continue on until I get to the bottom. Okay. So I'm going to keep going like this until I reach the bottom where this is xn. And what we're going to do as a result is we're going to consider, well, what are the possible Hamiltonian paths here? Well, each one of these independently has two choices about whether to go left or to go right. I can make those choices independently of each other because once I come down to this node, then the choice that I made up here is irrelevant compared to what I'm going to do with the x2 node. So there are two to the n possible ways 
possible Hamiltonian paths that go from the top to the bottom here. Note that that corresponds to all two to the n possible assignments to the variables. Isn't that pretty dang cool? So it's an embedding of the satisfying assignments as Hamiltonian paths here. So note that this is not taking into account the structure of the formula, right? That has the clauses and all the negations and all that stuff. So we're going to have to think about how that's going to work, as well as you may think, well, how many vertices am I going to have in here? That's going to depend on how the things are related in the clauses, which is what we're going to explore next. Okay, so we got the variable gadgets down, so I'm going to actually move these down so it's a little easier to see how things are going to work, and I'm going to put it on the left. And then now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the clause gadgets. We had variable gadgets in, in yellow right here. We're going to have clause gadgets. So let's say that the clauses are called C1 up to Cm, let's say. Well, each one of those is going to be exactly one vertex. So there's C2, C3, etc., up to Cm. So all of these are going to be the clause gadgets. And then what are we going to do here? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to associate the two directions that the, the x1 variable gadget could have taken and associate depending on how it appears in the clauses. So let's just say, just for sake of argument, that c1 is equal to x1 or not x2 or uh, not xn, let's say. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a place where in the, in the horizontal component of x1, we're going to allow ourselves to go over to c1 and then back and then continue as we were before. So note, the, in order to satisfy this clause, I only need x1 to be true or x2 to be false or xn to be false. I don't really care which one it is as long as one of them is true. So therefore, what we can do is, well, note that x1 appears as positive in this clause. So therefore, x1 has to be set to true in order to satisfy this clause, if that's the variable to satisfy it. If x1 is false, then x1 contributes nothing to this clause. So note that we had two directions in the x1 variable gadget before. So what we're going to do then is associate the true direction, which is going right here, with going out to C1 and coming back. So I'm actually going to blow up one of these variable gadgets so that we can actually see it a little bit better. So let's say that we had x1 right here. We had the direction going left, direction going right. And let's say we had these, um, we had these nodes going back and forth. So what we're going to do is because because x1 appears positively in this clause, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to have a, no let's say that we pick this node right here. I'm going to have a directed edge that goes out to C1. So it goes away from, from the x1 variable gadget. And then say we take that one, we want to say, okay, C1 is satisfied now. So we, we visited it. And so now I want to continue and maybe x1 can satisfy another clause, possibly. So then what I want to do is I want to come back, but I want to keep going in the same direction that we were going before. So notice that we left on the second node right here and came back on the third. So now let's think about how C2 is going to work. So let's make the variable gadget for C2. So this is the x2 node. And... Actually, I should say that x2 is the node, and I'll just put it over here. It's pretty clear what's going to happen. So then I'm going to have the left and right thing as before. And then here, because x2 appears negatively in this clause, what we're going to do is going to go the other way in terms of that clause. So for this one, this node, the third one, is the one that's going to go out to C1. So this one's going to go out to C1. And it's going to come back, you guessed it, at the other node, the, the one that's to the left. Because if we want x2 to satisfy this clause, we want it to be false. And so therefore we must or want to take the false direction in order to be able to go to c1. If we set x2 to be true, then that, meant, that meant we went this way. 
but we can't go out to C1. Well, we can try. We can say we can go up to here, and then we can try to go back, but in order to get to this third node, we had to have crossed this second one, which means that we will have seen that node twice, and that's just a big no-no. And what else can happen? Well, what can happen is, for example, we could, for X1, let's just say we come down left, we went out to the claws gadget, and we were cheaty, <laughs> and we went down to here, and then maybe we went, we went to here, maybe went to some other node, went to C2, and then maybe went back up to here, for example. So what we're going to do is we're going to enforce that that can't happen. So the main difficulty is that we can come back out from a lower node right here to a higher node and then just continue as if nothing happened. What we want to do is we want to have exactly one way that we could have gone in here instead of having allowing ourselves to go right here and then some at some point later we can go left here and then capture all the nodes there. The problem is how do we actually fix that? It's actually very, very easy. So let's visualize this again. So let's say that we have this node that goes left and right. Let's draw a few of them so we can see what happens. Okay, so something like this. Well, what, what can we do? Well, let's say that this node is the one that goes out somewhere and then this one comes back in. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say that this node right here is not dedicated to any clause, okay? So then maybe this one, maybe this one goes out and then this one comes back in as an example. But here, this node is isolated in some sense. It's not really isolated because it's connected to other stuff, but it's isolated from the pink edges right here. Why do we want such a thing? Let's suppose that we went out and then went down to a lower variable gadget, which came back up and then let's say came back down right here. Okay, well, it can't come over here. It can't go there because that meant that we have seen whatever vertex this is twice and that's not allowed because it's a Hamiltonian path. If we came back down here, for example, which is possible, then how do I get these two nodes? Well, I can't because in order to get this node, I need to go left, but if I go this way, I can't come back because I just visited this one, which means I have to keep going left, which means that I will have seen this vertex twice, and that's just not allowed. By having this one vertex in the middle, that allows us to force ourselves to go from the top variable gadget to the bottom, and it's just impossible to be able to go from one level, one variable gadget to another one, without having to go all the way across and then down. And so therefore, that forces us to be able to go through each variable gadget one at a time all the way through. And this guarantees that we have a Hamiltonian path if and only if the original formula was satisfiable. Why is that the case? So let's think about the formula. Well, the formula, you have to satisfy all the clauses, obviously. And so let's think about it. Well. If we have a way to satisfy all the clauses, that means that there is a variable assignment that causes all the clauses to be true, obviously. Well, let's think about how the Hamiltonian path will work. Well, the Hamiltonian path, that's going to go, let's say x1 was true. Then we're going to go the true direction. That's going to get us all the nodes in here. And whatever clauses it satisfies, we're able to go to that corresponding clause and then come back and it's in the right direction because x1 is satisfying those clauses. And they're separated, so I will be able to satisfy all the clauses that x1 can satisfy, which means all of the clause gadgets that it satisfies are gonna be visited at some point. So let's say like C1's visited. Well, C2 might not be visited, but since the formula is satisfiable, C2 must be able to be visited by some other variable gadget. And so therefore, there must be a way to visit all of the vertices in this graph, namely all the ones in the variable gadgets, which are easy to visit, but all of the clause ones too, without repeating a vertex at the same time. In the converse direction, if we have a way to visit every single one of these vertices in here, note that there's no edge coming into here. So in order to visit this vertex, I have to start here. And so therefore, since I start here at this top one, that means that there is a way I have to go left or I have to go right, which corresponds to setting the variable true or false. And the way we set it up 
If it's true, that means that whatever whatever way we get to the clauses that are satisfied by that particular variable, that clause is satisfied because in the way that we set it up, if we, for example, if C1 is satisfied by X1, that means that X1 has to be set to true because that's the direction we have to go in. We can't backtrack because it's a Hamiltonian path. We have a Hamiltonian path if and only if the original formula was satisfiable. So how do we actually make sure that we run in polynomial time because we have to make sure that the transformation takes polynomial time? Well, let's look at the picture down here. Well, each one of these pairs right here corresponds to a clause because each variable can appear in at most once per clause. We can say that every variable appears in every clause at most three times because it's three set. So we have that we have three nodes right here for every single one of the clauses, maybe times three for maybe multiple occurrences of the variable in each clause. But we will certainly have some constant maybe nine as an example, times the number of clauses, which is clearly polynomial in the size of the formula. So we have to base this on the size of the formula, not the size of the graph that we have. Well, the number of nodes per level is going to be some constant times the number of clauses in the formula, which is polynomial. Well, how many of these variable gadgets do I have? Well, one per variable in the formula, which is, again, polynomial. So a polynomial times another polynomial, surprise, is a polynomial. And what about the clause gadgets? Well, that's one per clause, which is only going to increase the constant by a little bit. And so therefore, we have proven that 3SAT reduces the Hamiltonian path because the runtime of the transformation is polynomial in the size of the formula, and we have a Hamiltonian path if and only if the original formula was satisfiable. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave comments about Hamiltonian paths into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.